Hi, I'm Peter Brusso for 101 Small Business Mastermind, and we got the whole crew with us uh, today. Uh, say good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. And good morning, Dick. Good morning, Dick. There you go. Um, no hams in this place, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, we've got lo lots to cover today, uh, but I wanted to go, you know, Frank's got this new Misfits, um, Entrepreneurs, Misfits, and Rebels group going, and, well, we've met three times, right, or four, three? Yeah, four. Yeah. yeah. And my first re-entry into this was ugly at best, and, and uh, so <clears throat> one of the members is actually doing a designing a business card. So we've seen the designs coming along. Um, and so I wanted to go through business card 101. And there's a guy that I learned all this from is, is a, he calls himself the fishing coach. And I did all his video and CD ROM materials back some time ago, but I didn't realize the strategy is as heavy as it is in business cards. So uh, I thought that would be helpful for everybody to hear that. Uh, so um, the first thing uh, about a business card is, w you know, what's the object of a business card? Many people will have all different kinds of ideas what it is, but it's supposed to be that you rem you're remembered by that person. There's something unique about your card that they remember you by. Otherwise, it's just one of the same, goes in the trash as soon as they get home, whatever. So the first, <clears throat> the first thing, excuse me, is um, to be memorable. And we did this for Dick uh, a, a few years back, but this is my business card, and I'll have a, a copy that goes over the top. And it's a CD-ROM that actually does, in fact, play in Windows computers. Is it memorable? Right off the bat. And Dick, uh, can I bug you enough to, to, to tell your experience with your business card when you were networking with it? Yeah, uh, we, uh, Peter, uh, uh, first of all, did a, uh, put the business card on a, a, a DVD, small, about the size of the one that he's holding right there. But along with that, uh, we developed a, what we call the surfboard. Oh, and, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we populated it with information on Legal Shield, uh, 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 kind of what it was about, and the whole thing. So, so without getting into you know the the detail per se, you know I would hand out the uh, the surfboard with the business card uh, uh, glued to it, and I would give it to to people. There, oh, there it is. Yeah, and uh, there was a tremendous. Uh, a tremendous tool that people would uh, they you know, normally you give a business card sometimes they look at it, sometimes they comment on it sometimes they don't they just put it in, the, in with the rest of them this one everyone commented on it and it was it was it, people would say geez that's uh, so big you know where am I going to put it and you just fold it into three little layers it fits right in your pocket your shirt pocket very nicely and all and it, it helped generate a lot of business for me. It was a, a good tool. Yeah, this is the high-tech, low-tech approach. We call this uh, piece back here the surfboard, um, two-sided. So, you know, if, if people uh, want the, the CD-ROM, they would pull it off. It's fugitively glued on there and throw the surfboard away. But it certainly is a conversational piece, and it's certainly memorable. People will run around, look at what this guy's got. Look at this, you know. That's happened more, more than once for me. So make your card hey, memorable. Excuse me, excuse me. One other thing is it, it's because it stood out uh, standalone, people would tell me that they, they, would just, they, they would put it on their desk and keep it right there by the desk. They wouldn't put it in the business card holder and all the other things. So you kept from going, you know, just going into the, with the rest of them. It has perceived value, so they don't throw this away. You know, now, now, granted, these these will cost you a buck a piece, but what's the business? I mean, it's priceless if you can get an account that pays for your entire business card run. Um, and even if they don't, uh, one of the things that I used to to do all the time is tell them that it makes a good drink coaster. And here is an example of a drink coaster, and it has four little feet. And uh, since I was doing 
marketing materials or, or projects for various people, I already had their, their um, uh, DVD uh, designed. And so it's really easy to print the label, stick it on, you know, a piece of material, uh, coat it with some, some uh, anti-water stuff, you know, and then put feed on it. So when you give out your business card, when it looks like this, you can always make the joke. If you, if you find it of no value at all, it makes a handy dandy drink coaster right by your computer. Which, what have you done? They look at it every day, you know, so it, it has, it, it should be a memorable thing. The other thing, there should be something that always stands out on the business card, something that they might focus on. And in this case, I have a little a QR code that if you shot it with your smartphone, takes you right to my website. So it, it gets you just off the material with a smartphone, and everybody's got those these days. Uh, Dick and I are a little ahead of the curve putting this stuff on our cards like that. And this is a much, much earlier card, and you see there's no QR code on that at all. Um, and then finally, when somebody hands you a card, you, you really need to take it with two hands and look at it intently, find something to comment back to them. And it makes them feel good that you actually pay attention to their card and you're interested in, in their particular card or material. And, and remember now also, the last piece is like the flyer lesson last week, the top one, uh, is 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 important as the bottom one in the far right hand corner uh, should be your way to get contacted. People read top to bottom, left to right. So some of the the flyer lessons certainly trans uh, translate right over to a business card. So that's um, that's what I wanted to talk about. Business card 101. Find something important to look at, comment on, make them feel good about that. And when you're designing your own card, keep something unique. Um, in mind. Now, on that same note, you know, Frank, we talked the other day, wouldn't it be phenomenal if we could get the, uh, the love pop group that with a three-dimensional thing to have a card that opens up 3D? Um, wow. Wouldn't that be crazy? That, that, that would become a keepsake. And oh. their cards are, they're, they're, they are phenomenal. Yeah, and it, it, it would be worth the price of admission to try to get them to do special project like right. that. Um, right. It would open up for, in my opinion, I think it would open up a whole new um, uh, source of revenue for them, right? Uh, yeah. They may not want to do the onesie twosies like that, but at the right price, you would do it every day, all day long, you make money at it. Plus, people that would use it would really stand out well. So mm -hmm. uh, that's my business card 101. Any questions on that? You know, I, it reminded me of, um, I was doing a work with some company based on La Jolla, as a matter of fact. And uh, one, of the, one of the two principals, we were talking about different stuff, and he said something. And the two principals were, were, were graduates of Xerox. They, 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 the Xerox selling system. That's right. what they used to, do, to sell copiers, and they were phenomenal with it. And uh, one guy said something to me, and just you may remind me of it. He said, Everything matters. Yes. Everything matters. Your business card matters. I have the business card as a place to put your name, maybe a picture, an email address, and telephone number. And I, well, who cares? If, and would, would you and, 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 uh, and Dick just pointed out, everything matters. So. Um, you know, and then Dick, uh, I think you also found people would, would pipe right up and start talking to you about your business card. And gives you a, a great opportunity to pick up a discussion with them. Yeah, it, like I said, they just didn't. They just didn't take it, you know. The, you, and and I, you know, based upon a lot of discussions we've had in the past, you know, I'd never just walk in and start handing out cards. I'd wait for people to ask me for my business card, and then I would give it to them. And then there would usually be a conversation about the business card. You know, this is unique. You know, why do you do this and the whole thing? And so it, it, it would it would open up the conversation to really uh, get the person to you know, feel comfortable talking with you and without doing a big sales pitch. So yeah. Now uh, on that same note, uh, a friend of mine uh, sent me some tie dye t-shirts. I've never had tie dye in my life, and I, w I grew up through the era. So he thought it would be funny to send me some tie dye. And 
in their shipping of their tie-dye material to me, they sent their business card, which is there. Now, you know, you can clearly see their business is branded because it's tie-dye, but they did a cardinal no-no on the back. You, it's so, the print is so small you cannot read it. And who's apt to, and this goes back to Frank's know your target market, who's apt to want tie-dye right now are people over 60. They can't read that without a magnifying glass. You know, so it really defeats the purpose uh, of this whole thing. And uh, so when you're designing your business card, you got to keep all this in mind, uh, font size. Um, I mean, and this is also bad because it's inverse video, which means this white lettering on a dark background makes it 25% harder for the human eye to read. And they put a reasonable amount of ad copy in the middle of this darn thing uh, that you can't read. Uh, and so why, in God's name, would you make it 25% harder for a potential client to read your message? doesn't make any sense, does it? No. no. So that's my business card 101. Very good. All right. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but you all seen, and I, last week I said, you know, I've been following the failure of social media. And Dick, Dick and I worked a lot of social media in our day. And uh, you hear all the hype of, you know, all about it and get all these followers and make all this money and Facebook marketing, and it's turned flat on its face. Now, what's worse is like Facebook, and you, you, all you have to do is look at the news, you know, with uh, them getting, even Facebook getting scammed, you know, by this, this company in England, uh, that if you take a survey, uh, matter of fact, there was one put out yesterday, a survey on Facebook from a friend of mine, and it's very clear that the questions that they were asking, that they were martial artists, there would be a, a sprinkling of martial arts question, and how much money do you make, where do you live, how many people in your household, you could clearly see it was going to be a marketing piece for somebody. And they have your IP address, so they know where you are at. So you're actually giving these these marketing people all this data in in and it was sent to me would you please help these guys are martial artists yeah right so um and in facebook thing uh, those that follow leo laporte for example <clears throat> the tech guy he's permanently deleted his uh facebook account yesterday because of if you fill out <clears throat> if you fill out a um questionnaire they get that. But what they also get is all of your friends' list of information as well, who your friends are. You're only priming the pump, and they're taking all this other data to market you without your permission. Even if you said on the privacy setting, don't give it out, this company in Cambridge, uh, England, um, uh, got all your friends' data if you signed, if you did this thing as well. So it's very clear uh, what's going on with this now. It's getting far too commercialized. Uh, there's not a lot of draw anymore for Facebook, and the only people that are on Facebook are older now. The, the young millennials and stuff have left Facebook uh, in droves, and they're heading to Instagram, for example. And then the question is, and I'll bring it out hopefully next week, the real question is, if you're using a social media platform, who owns it? So owned by Google, they own you again one more time. So uh, approach social media again with a little bit of a jaundiced eye, particularly if you think you're going to get a boatload of people uh, coming and buying your stuff. You have to do uh, far more research. And so <clears throat> it does change a bit of the paradigm that we've been working with for the last four or five years. Questions? Well, not, not a, a question. Uh, I'm, I'm really – surprised that people are shocked that Facebook had all that information on them because it's, it's to me, it's been a known fact for years. I, I have never filled out any of those surveys. I've never, any of those things where they ask questions or if I don't download an app, you know, do you want to go through Facebook? No. And, and if they're shocked by this, they should really look into Google because Google is 10 times worse than Facebook. Google could tell you where you've been and draw a map of where you've been for the last month. 
you know, uh, for the yeah. last the last ten years. Ten years, absolutely. So, you know what restaurant you go, what you order, yeah. how much how much you paid for. They know all that stuff. Absolutely. All through smartphone. Absolutely, and and so it just surprises me that there's so much. Uh, shock over over having it because it's it's uh, it, to me it's been a pretty known fact for for quite a while and you know I, I've I've dabbled in Facebook advertising and it's never it has not worked for me so doesn't mean it can't work for somebody but you have to it's not the panacea that they say it is no it's not yeah so yeah it takes a lot of time. You know, and on the positive side of that, I don't mind that Google knows what I like and who I am, because then they'll move relevant ads to me. I, I hate it when I get ads on. Oh, I should talk about that. So I got I got an email from Sprint. I'm a Sprint customer of 25 years. They send me a, an email. It's all in Spanish. Their marketing sucks because they they ought to know that I don't speak Spanish as a primary language. And yet they, they're so bold to send me an entire thing in Spanish. That's just stupid. But uh, that's a whole other story. So, all right. Uh, oh, shoot. Somebody give me a, a few seconds here. Say something whilst I get my prop up and going here. Mr. Prop Man. Mr. Producer. And? There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. Music to my ears. Love that sound. That means it's time for a twin this week in the news. And this week, I'm going to talk about Coel Tomei. Who I'm the heck is Coel? Coel, I'm glad you asked there, Mr. Mr. Karnak. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you five tidbits about Coel Tomei. Tidbit so. number one, the youth tidbit. Coel Tomei was born in Queensland, Australia to an American mother and a Canadian father. She had dual citizenship, therefore, Australian and American. And even though her parents were trained in other disciplines, they were both very successful entrepreneurs. Her father was a biologist, and he started a successful wildlife guiding business in Queensland. Her mother, specialized in education of the deaf, and much later in life, she started a successful craft business. So entrepreneurship was in Coel's blood. Coel's first job as a child was at a local ice cream shop. And as Coel states, this job taught me three important things. Number one, how to think laterally. What do I do next? What do I do next? Number two, how to be a good listener so I can get the order correct. Number three, how to interact with many types of people, anybody who walked into the ice cream shop. All these skills would serve her well, as you'll see, as she matured. Owell was raised by her mother, her parents divorced, who taught her two skills, other skills, that would directly impact her business success. And I think there's lessons here for parents. First thing Coel's mom, they, they use the word mom, taught Coel was how to handle the money. Coel was given an allowance, and Coel was responsible for managing all of her expenses. Not the mom, Coel was. Coel had to create a budget and prioritize how she would spend her allowance. So Coel was taught money management. But here's something else Coel was taught, which I'm pretty sure I didn't teach my kids, and I wish I had. Coel's mother taught her how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. What do I mean by that? Coel was constantly being dared by her mom to do the most ridiculous things. She was, as Cowell said, she always pushed me to step outside my comfort zone to do funny things, weird things, crazy things. She said, this taught me not to take myself so seriously and taught me something else. What's the worst thing that could happen if I did this? What? Some people might think I'm nuts. 
So what? Both Coel's father and mother encouraged her that whatever she did, do what made her happy. I would say that Coel had a very supportive and happy childhood in Australia's Gold Coast. Tidbit number two, I called the walkabout tidbit. I didn't know what a walkabout was until I researched this. As is the tradition for some Australian youth, they would explore the world before settling down. They called this a walkabout. Well, Cowell started her walkabout in the Western United States. Remember, she had dual citizenship, so it was easy for her to do that. And as most pretty young, lady, or young ladies do, she met a guy. And the guy was based in Boulder, Colorado, and Cole, Cowell wound up in Boulder, Colorado. I had never been to Boulder, but it, it, it turns out that uh, Boulder is a mecca for people who are passionate about eating, cooking, and natural foods. Interestingly enough, these are all the things that Cowell was passionate about. Well, Cowell got a job because she was going to stay in Boulder, Colorado, and her first job was working in a cubicle, we all know what those are like, for an IT company. And as Cowell states, and I'll quote her directly, this job sucked the soul right out of me. God, she hated it. She remember her parents stressing, Cowell, do what you're passionate about. And you know what? IT was not it. Well, Cowell was passionate about food. So she says, duh, I'm going to get a job working in the natural food industry. Well, there was one problem, though. Except for eating it, Cowell had no food experience. But Cowell remembered what her mom taught her. Step outside your comfort zone. She says, what's the worst thing that could happen? These companies are going to say no. So what was her attitude? So Cowell sent out application after application after application to all the food companies in the Boulder, Colorado area. And she got rejection after rejection after rejection, except for one. A company called Izzy, which is a natural soda company, I-Z-Z-E. -Z -E. I've seen their bottles. They hired her. Well, Cowell worked at Izzy for four years. And she worked her up her way up to be supply chain manager. This became very important later in her career. Things are starting to build for her. Tidbit number three, I call the vacation tidbit. Shortly after starting her job at Izzy, Cowell took a vacation trip to Australia to visit her mum. And it was during her 2005 vacation trip to Australia that Cowell discovered something that would change her life forever. She was touring the various shops near her mom's home when she came across a locally made yogurt. Well, Cowell liked yogurt. It was interesting because this yogurt was in a clear package and had passion fruit flavor. Passion fruit happens to be her favorite flavor. So she bought it and took it back to her mom's house. She ate the yogurt and its revolutionary taste stopped Cowell in her tracks. It was a full fat yogurt, not the trendy low fat and no fat. That was a craze of all the foodies at that time in 2005. And the passion fruit puree that was mixed in the yogurt was as pure as she had ever tasted. She thought to herself, there is no yogurt in the U.S. came even close to this yogurt. And she had tried just about all of them. The brand was called Noosa, N-O-O-S-A. It was named after a beach town on the Gold Coast of Australia. She wanted to bring this full fat, full flavored yogurt to the U.S. So she told her mum about her idea. And her mum encouraged Cowell to contact the Matheson family. They were the people that owned Noosa yogurt. And as her mum reminded her again, Cowell, if you contact them, what's the worst that could happen? They say no, so what? So Cowell contacted the Matheson company, got family, and she set up to meet with them, and she did. And she did, and she told them how blown away she was when she had her first taste of Noosa yogurt and how she wanted to bring Noosa to the United States. The Matheson family listened politely, and Cowell, thank you 
for your praise and your interest, but we are very content with having Nusa Yoga just being sold in our local area. In other words, thanks, but no thanks, Coel, goodbye. Well, Coel returned back to the U.S. and her job at Izzy, and she was dejected and depressed, but still dreaming. She never stopped dreaming. While working at Izzy, Cowell could not shake the taste experience of that Australian yogurt. And she talked about it so much that one day her boss pulled her inside and said, Cowell, you are obsessing about this yogurt. You should just go for it again. Hmm. So on her next vacation to Australia to visit her mom, Cole's mom encouraged her to contact the Matthewson family again. She did. And Matthewson family were just very nice, very polite. And they said, tell you what, Let's meet for lunch this time. I guess they thought of, hey, at least I'll, I'll get, get something to eat while I'm being sweet to this young Australian girl. And after a long lunch with the Matheson family and many beers, Cowell states that this is an Australian tradition. Cowell told them again how much she believed that Nusa, Nusa yogurt was the most delicious yogurt on earth and that she needed to eat it more than once a year when she visited her mom. She was using her emotion. And then Kobo says, I've got a different relationship proposal for you. Will you, the Matthewson family, license me the recipe to your yogurt so that I could produce it in the United States? Matthewson family says, what have I got to lose? Okay. And they granted her the license to, to use the recipe. From that lunch with many beers, a business relationship between Kobo Tomei and the Matthewson family was created. Tidbit number four, I call this the coffee shop tidbit. So Cole returned to the United States, all ex I mean, she was out of her mind, all excited what she had just accomplished. She was going to start her own business. She was gonna do something she was passionate about. These are important to her. And she had the rights to the recipe for the best yogurt in the world. What could possibly go wrong? Then as we say in the US, then the yogurt hit the fan. The yogurt hit the fan. Cowell was delving deep into what it takes to start a business in the US. After all, she's Australian. And she was going through all the rules and regs. And then she says, oh man. She quickly learned of the complex dairy regulations to start a dairy kind business in the United States. She read it and studied it and thought about it. And she says, man, these presented so many hurdles. And you know what? I, I can't do this. I'm not prepared to take this on herself. But Corwell was not prepared to give up her dream of starting a yogurt business. So one day she was in a coffee shop in Boulder, Colorado, thinking and pondering and obsessing, if you will, about a yogurt business. And she noticed a flyer at the coffee shop. And the flyer was for a local dairy. She says, I'm going to cold call this dairy and speak to the owner from her training with her mom. Cowell, what's the worst that can happen? He's going to say no. Right? Well, she called and Rob Graves, Jarevia, a fourth generation of the owner farm, of the dairy farm, took the call and agreed to meet with Cowell at the farm. Well, Cowell was excited. She said, man, this is awesome. So she visited him at the farm, toured the farm, and it was all good stuff. And she told him of her visit to Australia and how she was blown away by this full-fat Musa yogurt and how she had acquired the rights, the worldwide rights, to use this recipe and her desire to start a, yo a yogurt business. He listened. He was very polite and agreed to, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. We know what that means, the kiss of death, right? So Colwell left knowing that she had a lot more work to do to convince Rob of her idea for a yogurt business. She got home and told, called her mom instantly and told her what had happened. And she said, Mom, I don't know what you have to do, but I need samples of Moose yogurt sent to me in Boulder, Colorado as soon as possible. Don't know how her mom did it, but soon after that conversation, Cole received samples of Nusa yogurt in Colorado. She called Rob again and says, Rob, 
Got to set up another meeting, one more meeting to talk about our business idea. Again, when they met, this time she gave Rob a sample of Nusa Yoga to taste. And the moment he tasted the sample, he was sold on the idea. And he jointly agreed with Coel to start a yoga business. Today, I'm Coel Tome. I am the co-founder of Nusa Yoga. So I was home visiting my family in Australia. Noosa is this really cool little beach community in my home state. And I was coming back from the beach, stopped at the local corner shop and discovered this clear tub with a pop of passion fruit, which is a you know, quintessential Aussie flavor and my favorite flavor. Didn't quite know what it was and picked it up. It was completely unbranded, discovered it was yogurt. And I was like, I'm going to try this. And I've eaten a lot of really good food in my life, but this truly was literally the best thing I've ever tasted. As an Aussie expat, you get very sort of wistful about things you discover in your homeland that you don't get to eat. And I was working for a startup beverage company at the time, and I sort of thought, well, if they can do it, why can't I? Um, so I just went for it. I figured out a way to, you know, connect with this Australian family and license their recipe. Came back to Colorado, very feeling very like elated and bullish, but with no plan. So I was in the search for a great dairy partner and I was in my local coffee shop in Boulder and I saw a fly for Morning Fresh Dairy and their story immediately resonated with me. It was a fourth generation dairy farm, all natural, not treating their cows with growth hormones, growing all their own feed. And so I essentially cold called and connected with Farmer Rob. You know, so sort of just had a chat. I think he thought I was a little, a little crazy. I grew up with dairy. That's about all I know is dairy farm, dairy cows. My great-grandparents, I think, arrived here in the 1890s. I guess I think of the sacrifices my grandparents, my parents have made, you know. It's a commitment to um, a way of life. Over a hundred and some years, we've always stayed, we've worked the land, it's part of us. There's a lot of pride in what we do and what we do as a team. You know, the schoolhouse, my grandfather went to school here a hundred years ago. With Nosen and the growth, you know, we've got a lot of change going on, a lot of new. By preserving this, it just reminds us where we came from. I was never a yogurt fan. It wasn't until I actually got him a sample of the yogurt. I had to get my mom to actually smuggle, ship it from Australia. After trying the yogurt, I decided we can make this. The rest is history. We just kind of hit the ground running. It's been all-consuming, challenging, but very rewarding. You know, Colorado, I think, really does resonate with people and sort of this idea of food and culture and just community. So it's been amazing for us to sort of grow up here and have the community just sort of embrace the product. It really has sort of translated into this larger success. I'm mainly just proud that we were able to do this in Bellevue, Colorado. <laughs> After, you know, growing up here, small town, uh, this is a true success story on a small little farm. Tidbit number five, I call it the Noosa tidbit. In 2009, Rob Graves and Crowell Tomei founded the Noosa Yogurt Company in Colorado. Cowell invested her life savings to fund a yogurt machine. Her thought was, going back to her mom again, what's the worst that can happen? If this Noosa yogurt company doesn't work, I'll get a job and start all over again. No big deal. For the first three years of their company, Cowell and Rob did not take any income from Noosa. Didn't bother Rob because he had his dairy business. But Cowell, got a second job to pay her bills. 
Noosa had no money budgeted for marketing. So Robin Noel made yogurt in small batches, and Coel will go to fairs, farmers markets, and larger gatherings, wherever people were, set up a little table and get out samples of, of the Noosa yogurt to drive word of mouth to, and to try and sell Noosa yogurt. They started getting small local retailers to sell their yogurt. Now, Rob was already selling bottled milk to the local Whole Foods stores, and the buyer agreed to meet with Rob and Noel to consider selling Noosa yogurt at the local Whole Foods stores. But when they met with the Whole Foods buyers, he had a problem with their packaging. He hated it. It was large, not the standard yogurt size, and they're all concerned about packaging. It was transparent. That makes no damn sense at all. Why do you want to see yogurt is yogurt? Don't worry about it. It was like anything else on the yogurt aisle. He wanted a package, packaging changed or Whole Foods would most likely not stock Noosa yogurt. Here's where Colwell did her thing. She changed the subject to taste. and says, before we talk about that, I want you to taste this sample. He liked it. It was like anything on the market. Then she told Whole Foods, oh, by the way, it's too late to change the packaging because we've already purchased and installed the equipment. Not quite true but it was in the works. The buyer relented and agreed to stock Noosa yogurt in the packaging that he hated. Now, ironically, Noosa is still using that same packaging today, and it became a game changer for them. There was nothing else like it in the yogurt section, and customers have told them that they bought their first Noosa yogurt because it looked different, and the transparent pack packaging make it look fresh. Their packaging disrupted the yogurt aisle. It didn't fit in little, little slots. They were growing at a steady but slow pace. Cowell was also taking any profits that they made from Noosa Yogurt, and she was going to national food shows, again, giving out samples. In 2012, it was at one of these food shows that a buyer from Target visited their booth, tasted the yogurt, and the taste wowed him as well. He decided to do a trial and stock Noosa yogurt at 250 super target stores. This is where Coel's supply chain experience that she learned at Izzy came into play. She had worked with the target supply chain, so she knew how to deliver and service target the way they wanted to be serviced. The target went well, and they expanded Noosa yogurt to 1,500 target stores. In a few years, Noosa was doing over $100 million a year in revenue. In 2014, Carwell Tomei and Rob Graves decided that the best way to take Noosa Yogurt to the next level was to sell the company. Their asking price was $600 million. Advent, a company called Advent, bought the company. Now, I don't know how much, because Noosa was privately held, I don't know how much Advent paid to acquire Noosa, but Carwell and Rob are still smiling. Not bad for a young lady who started at an ice cream shop. And as I was thinking about this, I said, you know what? The Kobo Tomei story is a twist on that classic girl meets boy love story. And his, and by, by copy, this is not my idea. But that comes, girl meets yogurt. Girl falls in love with yogurt. Girl brings yogurt home. Everybody falls in love with yogurt. And five years later, girl sells yogurt and makes millions of dollars. Coel Tomei is a superstar. And as again, I took it, then I, I redo and see what lessons I can have. And I, say, and I said, Coel Tomei is a superstar because she does the things that most entrepreneurs don't do. I've identified six situations where Coel Tomei did what most people don't. The first is what I call the Australian Noosa situation. And I'll describe it. Cowell met with the Matheson family with a proposal to expand Noosa yogurt distribution to the U.S. They rejected her proposal. A year later, Cowell met with them again over lunch with, and beers with a different proposal. Most people would stop pursuing the Matheson family after they were rejected the first time. They would discard their idea to distribute Noosa yogurt and go on to their next stream. Oh, they don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. Cowell told me, after being rejected the first time, was even more determined to expand Noosa yogurt to the U.S. 
Crowell came back with a different proposal. She wanted the rights to use the family recipe. She take the responsibility for producing it. They agreed, and Cole had the beginnings of a startup company. Three entrepreneur questions. Is there someone you wanted to engage with to help your business that rejected your proposal? If that someone would agree, how much would it help your business? And can you craft an alternate proposal that they would accept and would also help your business like Cowell did? Number two, the dairy farmer situation. While sitting in a coffee shop, pondering how to solve her overwhelming dairy regulations problem, Cowell came across a flyer promoting a local dairy, and she cold called the dairy farmer to set up the meeting. Most people would notice the flyer, think about calling the dairy farmer, but not make the call because cold calling made them uncomfortable. Some people might send a, an email to the dairy farmer requesting a meeting and hope that they would call back. Cowell commented, did something different. Thanks to her mom's training, Cowell became comfortable with the uncomfortable. She called and scheduled a meeting. After the pitch, she noticed that the dairy farmer was lukewarm for starting, and Cowell was not deterred. She scheduled a second meeting, this time bringing samples of the Australian yogurt, and he agreed to partner with Cowell to start the yogurt business. Three questions. How committed are you to growing your business? Are you willing to be uncomfortable in order to grow your business? What uncomfortable things should you do now to grow your business? The all-in situation, number three. No matter how uncomfortable Cole was, Cole was all-in when she and Rob agreed to start the Lucy Yogurt Company. Most people will gladly start a business as long as it's not too inconvenient. After all, they have a life outside the business. Cole says, my business is my life. And she became comfortable with the uncomfortable. She invested her life savings to start Lucy Yogurt. What's the worst that can happen? It failed, she start again. She took no pay from Lucy for the first three years. She got a second job to pay the bills. Cowell was all in. My question is for entrepreneurs. Are you all in to grow your business? What uncomfortable thing could you do that could potentially grow your business? If you have not yet done this uncomfortable thing, are you really all in? Fourth one, the buck to trend situation. When Cowell started Nusi Yogurt, the usually popular trend was low-fat yogurt. By the way, it still is. Most people would follow this trend and introduce their version of a low-fat Nusi Yogurt. They would rather be one of the many yogurt companies offering low-fat because that's what people wanted. Cowell Tomei did just the opposite. She was comfortable bucking the low-fat trend. She wanted Nusi to be different. She did not want to waver from the original Nusa recipe. She had, told, she had already tasted low-fat yogurt, and it was not very good. She believed people would accept full-fat yogurt if the flavor was outstanding. Three questions. Do you want your business to stand out from your competitors? Are you willing to defy the trend? How soon will you promote and offer something that bucks the trend? Situation number five, the bootstrap marketing. Zero cost marketing. When New Sea Yogurt was started, there was no money in a budget for marketing. Most people would either charge their credit cards or borrow money to market their product. How else are you going to introduce your product and make sales, right? You got to pay for marketing. Cowell Tomei used her ingenuity and hard work to market New Sea Yogurt. She produced samples of different flavors. Then she attended fairs, country markets, anywhere people were gathered to hand out New Sea Yogurt samples. She generated word of mouth marketing. Three entrepreneur questions. Do you believe in bootstrap marketing? If you had no other choice, how would you market your products or services with bootstrap marketing? Why aren't you doing bootstrap marketing now for your business? And finally, the last situation I call the whole food situation. Whole Foods strongly suggested that they would not stock Nusi yogurt unless they changed their packaging. Most people would change their packaging to meet Whole Foods' demands. Number one, the customer's always right, and they are Whole Foods. Who are we? Nobody's to challenge their request. Come says, no, nah, I'm not going to change the packaging. I wanted Nusa to stand out in the yogurt aisle. She believed that the clear packaging would reinforce their natural food image. And she, by the way, she also told Whole Foods it was too late. They had already purchased and installed the equipment. 
my three questions. Does your product or services clearly stand out from your competition? How can you repackage your product and services to clearly stand out? And how soon can you repackage your product and services? In, in looking at this, I became very curious and I said, I wonder if anybody here locally sells Lucy yogurt. I visited Winco, I visited Stater Brothers, I visited Albertsons, and I visited Ralph's. All four were selling Lucy yogurt in the clear packaging. And boy, did it stand out. I bought one of each flavor, different ones. Damn, it is really good. It is really, really good. I will never have low fat yogurt again. And gentlemen, that's my story about Coel to me, today's superstar, and my twin. That's it. Well, I'm shocked, Frank, that you didn't drive out here and give me some Newsom yogurt. Well, Dick and I can eat Newsom yogurt at the same Noosa, time. Noosa, Noosa, Noosa. 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 Yeah, Noosa, Noosa. <laughs> Noosa yogurt, you know. Noosa I mean, yogurt. Uh, we, we would have liked that, huh, Dick? Well, he's coughing. Yeah, it is. It is really good. It is. I mean, because it's full flat and full flavor. Um, my favorite is they have something called a mate, which is like a vanilla flavored base, and at the top it has a package, has little mixins that you put, like like the one that's chocolate, uh, coconut, and something. What third one? And and you mix it yourself and eat it, man. And it's under three hundred calories. It is real, but it has carbs. I know you're in, you're into carbs. Yeah, well, you know, if I started eating that, I'd be back to being a diabetic. Yeah, yeah, no, and we don't do it not for you, but it is. I'll tell you, I can see why people are blown away by its flavor. It is that good. So that's my Caldwell Tomei story. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. All right, uh, Dick, do you have any questions on that before we swing it over to you? No, and I, I, I think Peter, I, I don't think I, without coughing a lot, I've been coughing this whole time. I'm, I'm going to past the next week as far as doing anything so okay yeah i just can't shake this cough yeah well we're also coming up on your uh, deadline too to get you uh off and running to your next uh project so all right um uh frank anything more before we bring it to a close no no i think um no, I, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm curious about, I want to say one last thing, but I know because I didn't have a chance to say it a lot. I didn't. I was thinking of something else. Um, I don't mind Facebook having my information. I don't mind Ralph's having my information of what I buy because when I get coupons in the mail, I used to get coupons for crap I would never think about. You know what I get coupons for now? Stuff relevant. I buy. Yeah, relevant stuff. stuff. I, I don't, yeah. And I don't mind Google sending me ads of stuff I'm interested in. And no, I don't I, mind Amazon. I don't mind Amazon recommending books like the books I bought from them. Right. It doesn't bother me. Um, uh, me either, by the way. I like relevant ads. Uh, I like want to look at stuff I'm interested in. Do you have that business card that we talked about? Uh, you found it, Stephanie's card. Oh yeah, right here. Yeah. Um, an example of something. Why don't you talk about that business card? Yes, this is a lady, let me put up to let you know, this is a lady that the, uh, I think the three of us met at a, a local networking event, and she does some kind of, I don't know what the hell she does, wellness thing, I don't know if it was multi, I think it was multi-level marketing, and her business card was maybe one inch by three and a half inches, and the front is just a picture of her, and, she's, I, and she can do it because she's obviously an attractive lady, and the back just has a little bit of information and her contact information, and you can't put it in a folder. You can't put it in a business card holder, you know? And so I kept it. And this was maybe four years ago that, that I got a business card, and it was still here in my desk. Memorable, to use your term. Memorable. Yeah, you know, uh, um, we talked about it in the, in the green room, but um, I don't know that we got it on, on camera here, but uh, the Love Pop three-dimensional oh, yeah. cards, <clears throat> if we could get them to do a three-dimensional business card, would be a game changer. It would, it, it, people would never, would not want a, a normal business card again. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't it, agree. It, was, it, it is that memorable. Yeah. yeah. And all this from two guys walking the streets of Ho Chi Minh City one night killing time and they saw a street vendor. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that would be the love pop people for those that didn't you know, get yeah, yeah, that, yeah, the didn't see that last week's show. So, all right, guys. Well, say goodnight, Frank. Good night, Frank. Uh, say goodnight, Dick. Goodnight, Dick.